Hello, friends. I'm Brian Peart, and I want to welcome you to the Great Awareness Podcast, a podcast focused on helping Christians make sense of this world we are in. The goal is to encourage, but never at the expense of truth. We will take the truth found in Scripture and apply it to the real spiritual battles going on today. We will ignore preconceived beliefs, news media noise, and politicians' words, and look at actions, what is really going on. Then use the truth of Scripture to accurately discern the times and how we need to respond. Jesus said in John 8.32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that is what we are going to attempt to do with each podcast. Get to the truth so we can live as we've been called. What I'm going to share today is sort of heavy, but I encourage you to listen through to the end because it's got a positive ending. You've got to understand something here. I have no agenda. I'm not running ads, no donations, not even a Q&A or comments because I want this message to be pure. I don't want to get congratulations emails or texts and get prideful and I don't want to have too much criticism and uh, shy away from sharing what I feel the Lord wants me to share. I just want to freely share with you what I've learned, what the scripture says and what's really going on spiritually in our world with the goal of encouraging you. No ulterior motive, just the pure how I see it, how I've lived it and what I see in scripture. Today though, kind of looking ahead because I believe I've been shown something and I, and I need to share it. The first pad, podcast we did, we dealt with the lie of the pre-trib rapture. If you remember, if you listen, that came about from a time in 2009. Uh, back then, my mother-in-law at the time was really big on this end of the world idea that Obama was the Antichrist. And she kept pushing that on my wife at the time. And it was becoming a contentious thing in the home. So I took a week off. I went down to Florida and I fasted and I prayed. I just, me, the Bible, and what are you showing me here, Lord? And through that, he led me first to Jesus's discourse in Matthew. Then he led me to Daniel and kind of the timeline of uh, the tribulation period. I did not get the thing I was looking for. When would it all start? But I did discover through that the tribulation period is going to be a seven-year period. It's in Daniel 9, 27, and then he confirms it in Daniel 12. And at the midpoint of that tribulation, there's going to be an abomination that causes desolation, and the Antichrist is going to be fully revealed, and it's going to be a time of great trial and struggle, okay? So it's a seven-year period. It starts with the Antichrist making a covenant or a treaty with many, and then three and a half years in, breaking that treaty, setting up some sort of shrine or something to himself in the holy place, Jerusalem. At that point, to the end, when Jesus comes, is another three and a half years. So that was kind of the timeline, but it doesn't really say when. But now I knew the flow of how it was going to go. That was 2009, and I kind of kept it to myself because that timeline did not really correspond to what I had learned from the Baptist church I was going to, from most of the uh, well-known preachers at the time who believed in a pre-trib rapture. I just kind of kept it quiet and pondered it in my heart. Then about two years ago, something else was shown to me when I was reading 2 Peter chapter 3. And this passage of scripture is pretty interesting. Peter is describing the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord, the day of Jesus' second coming, actually is prophesied a lot. Joel talks about it. Many of the Old Testament prophets, all of the apostles thought that Jesus was going to be coming before they died. And actually, you can see in chapter 3 here where, as I read it in a minute, people were actually scoffing at Peter and them because he hadn't come yet. So I'm going to read right now in Second Peter chapter 3, this little discourse here, it says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt away. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So what hit me as I was reading this was this verse 8 that says, 
a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. And then I thought about the crucifixion, that whole story, where he was in the grave for two days, and then he rose again on the third day. And I said, what if the two days that he was in the grave is is 2,000 years? What if Peter was almost prophetic here? What if that was 2,000 years? And on the third day, he rose again, and that was the th- another 1,000 years, right? 1,000 years is to a day. Well, after Jesus comes in Revelation chapter 20, he sets up a 1,000-year reign on, on this earth. And I'm reading Revelation 20, verse 4, and it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there's a thousand year reign. So all of a sudden I looked at it and I'm like, wow, what if something like that could actually happen? So when you go back, most scholars say that Christ was crucified around 33 AD. There's been lots of historical references to that. It's pretty much knowledge that right around 33 AD, give or take, is where when Jesus was crucified. So two days in the grave, 2,000 years. So 2,000 years after 33 AD is 2033 give or take, like I said, maybe changes between the Jewish calendar and the Roman calendar, but right around 2033 then would be his return, okay? Daniel says it's a seven-year period. So if he returns in 2033, which is 11 years away, then seven years prior to that is when the tribulation period would start, which would be around 2026, and that will start the final seven years. So, It's possible that over the next few years, someone will rise to power. Around 2026, he'll make a treaty with many. Three and a half years later, in 2030, he will break that treaty and set up the abomination. And three and a half years later, Christ will return, set things right, and set up the thousand-year reign. So we're kind of combining a couple things. Daniel's prophecy plus this thousand-year. And I absolutely know that this is just one guy saying it. I've not seen this anywhere else. And I know the argument. Jesus said that no man will know the day or the hour in Matthew 24, 36. But he says nothing about knowing the month or the year, just the day or the hour. And before this verse in Matthew 24, 32 through 35, he says, we will see when it comes close. There's tender shoots. You'll know that summer is near and so we'll see the signs. So second Peter here talking about a day is a thousand years and a thousand is a day. And then he describes Jesus is coming. To me, that was an incredible coincidence. But again, who am I, first off, to even get some sort of insight like that? And I'm not a preacher. I'm not some great man of God. I'm just a servant of the Lord. And so I kind of kept to myself. Plus, what I've been finding more and more as I talk to people about things is that people really, they just don't want to hear things if it's not in their point of view. I think social media has really begun to make this something that that is really problematic for the church and for all of us. Because John over there will say something into his little Facebook group and a a couple people say, attaboy, amen, or whatever. Now, John's opinion has become fact to John and John has identified with that opinion. So now if someone even says anything opposite or even throws up an idea that's counter, John feels like he's being attacked. And that's what kind of has happened with this social media phenomenon. And unfortunately, it creates people that don't really want to even hear another side. And That's really unfortunate because it limits your growth. And the other side is where you're going to learn some things. And so because of all this, I kind of kept that silent. So what I learned in 09, I kind of kept silent. What I learned a couple of years ago, I kind of kept silent. But then things are starting to happen here in 2022 that I'm like, it's starting to happen. It's happening before our eyes. And I feel like I need to share it. Now, as I said, I could be wrong. We won't know for sure until about 2026 or 2027, whether this is actually a prophecy or whether it's actually actually just a zealous believer, just sold out and reading too much into things. But check this out. When Putin attacked Ukraine, that to me was the start of the Third World War. A lot of people were saying that back then, but here in June, that was in uh, February, here in June, the media is not mentioning that war barely at all. They're talking about gun control and the abortion thing and all these things are coming back and becoming noise again. But if you look, Hitler attacked Poland to start World War II because parts of it were once German. Germany. 
Putin attacked Ukraine, which to me was the start of World War III, because that had once been part of Russia. History repeats itself. And just like World War II didn't stop in Poland, I don't believe this one's going to stop in Ukraine. The media is not playing it up, but that doesn't mean it's not so. And while media in America is focusing everybody on gun control, race, abortion, etc., there's real stuff happening in the world. Sides are being drawn, guys. Neutral countries like Finland and Sweden are petitioning to join NATO. Increasingly, it's looking like it's going to be NATO against it some sort of China, Russia, maybe an OPEC, Saudi alliance, kind of a new access of evil. We're watching unfold in front of us, okay? Um, just because you don't hear something in the news doesn't mean it may not be happening, okay? We, we've got to be aware of what's going on if we're going to be Christians. The First World War started in July of 28, 1914, and it lasted four years. The Second World War started September 1, 1939, and it lasted six years. When I told my son, Phoenix, that the First World War was four and the second was six, he goes, well, then the third's going to be eight. I'm like, eh, out of the mouth of babes, right? Four, six, eight. So the Third World War started February 24th, 2022. That's when Putin invaded Ukraine. And if it lasts eight years, that takes it to 2030. If you remember from that seven-year thing, 2030 would be in the timeline where the midpoint would happen and the abomination of desolation would be set up. It's kind of freaky that that's happening at the same time. And again... There's going to be scoffers to all of this, and I'm not claiming I know anything. I'm just saying there's some stuff that's coming together that really looks pretty insane, and it's worth at least watching. Putting this all together, this is how I see it playing out. The war continues. Someone starts to really shine and lead powerfully. Some leader takes control. I don't know who. Begins to really grow in power. And around 2026, about four years from now, sets up a treaty with many. And he consolidates his power. Now, not all with many. So there's still going to be a war. But his side reigns victorious and the war ends in 2030. At that point, he sets up the abomination or a shrine to himself because he's the one who's brought, quote unquote, peace to the world. And then three and a half years later, 2033, Jesus comes. Christians likely after that abomination will be attacked. In Revelation 13, it says the Antichrist will be given power to make war with the saints and overcome them for 42 months, which is three and a half years. And then Jesus comes. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm really not. I don't believe in Illuminati. I just see no mention of Illuminati in scripture. The enemy is Satan. He uses people. He uses governments. But that's the real enemy. You know, power corrupts. We've all heard this. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And all governments, even ones that start good, because of their power, eventually become corrupt. And once they do, they become tools of the devil. And maybe there are wealthy people that he's using, and, and but he certainly, Satan, can use and influence governments. Putin, Zelensky, even President Biden can all be pawns in this game. Now, you may say, Brian, I don't want to hear this. This isn't a world war. It's just a skirmish. It's never going to go beyond Ukraine's borders. I don't want to hear that there's only 10 or 11 years left on this planet until Jesus comes. I just don't want to hear any of that. And I understand that people are weary. They're tired. And really, there's two groups of people, you know, the people that are seeing things happening and getting really, really angry about it. And then the people that are just checking out. And neither of them is really a, a good response to what's going on. You don't want to check out and then get broadsided and you don't want to become militant either. Okay. And I get it. I didn't want to hear any of this either. And, and again, I'm, I'm kind of hoping I'm wrong, but it's coming together way too smoothly. It's almost like it's orchestrated and not just orchestrated now, but orchestrated over many, many years. Check this out. In World War I, it started 728 of 1914. If you add those numbers together, seven, take out a calculator, seven plus 28 plus 19 plus 14, you get 68. World War II started September 1, 9-1 of 1939. If you add 9 plus 1 plus 19 plus 39, you get 68. Same number. I say World War III started 2-24-2022. You add 2 and 24 and 20 and 22 together, and you get 68. It's a stunning coincidence, okay? And maybe it is a coincidence, but if it's not, this thing's been planned for a really long time. It's kind of like 9-11 happened on 9-11, 9-1-1. Was that a coincidence or was it planned out? Not being a conspiracy theory, when it says it seems like it was planned out to that particular day. They could have bombed on any day. They just chose on that day. Very much similar here. 
And it could be things are coming together. They're drawing to a conclusion. It could be that this 2,000 years that Peter's talking about is the time that was allotted for us. And, and it could be that this great drama that has been unfolding for all these years kind of start coming together into a cres- crescendo. And the thing is, it's all prophesied, right? It's all in Scripture. So let's not get thrown off by media noise. Let's look beyond and look at the spiritual. We have an enemy. He's moving his pieces. This great drama is coming to a final end, but we know who wins in the end. We know how this plays out. So how should we live and what should we do? You know, the first thing I want to overemphasize is we can't be afraid. Every time I hear people talk about the Illuminati, it's from a fear-based thing. And the Bible says that the fear of man is a snare. That's not who you got to worry about. You know, whoever the the people you believe are the Illuminatis are, that's not the real story behind the scene. In the Bible, in Revelation, you've got Satan, you've got the Antichrist who he gives his power to, you've got Jesus, you've got Michael the angel up there who defeats Satan and throws him down to heaven. You have the two witnesses. You have certain players in the scene. Nowhere in there is a bunch of Illuminati kind of controlling everything. What you do have is an enemy that can whisper into our ears, that can deceive and can lie and can create disruption. And what you need to understand is he has no authority over the believer. Satan has no authority over the believer. We just don't exercise that authority. I'll give you an example. The first podcast I did a few weeks ago or a month ago, I woke up that morning and I was just under attack. I felt heavy burden. I I almost felt sick to my stomach and I almost canceled doing it, but I ground through it. I have no doubt that Satan was trying to keep me from doing that podcast, but I ground through it. After I was done, all of that went away and I was, and I was fine and, and I enjoyed the rest of my day. The next podcast I did, last week's podcast, he started earlier, Saturday. I had the message totally ready and then Saturday I started getting an idea of a different message, started writing that down, but didn't complete it. Then Sunday, I went to church and the pastor was talking about how he had one message and then he was changing that message. Then I'm starting to think, man, should I be changing that message? And then I had another message and I started writing that down. So I've got like two incomplete things there. I'm waking up Monday morning a mess and I'm recording on Tuesday and I just settled myself down. I went to the Lord and he just calmly spoke to me. Anytime you've got confusion, that's the devil. God's small, still voice will give calm instruction. And if you don't have that clear instruction, you wait for it. But don't think the, dis- the disruption is or the confusion is from God. It's, it's not. What he shared with me was, Brian, you're not doing these live. Okay, these other two little messages, you can expound on them and go later, but you're totally ready to deliver this certain message, deliver that message. And and that was it. I The day of the podcast, there was no heaviness in my spirit. My assistant, Mary, came in and said, man, I, I just, in my spirit, feel really good about this podcast today. And it was like, all right, he tried to throw me off the day of the first podcast. Then last time he tried to use confusion. This time, nothing. There was no attacks. There was no anything. It's been completely smooth. Confirmations everywhere. And he has no authority over me. He's he's had to back off because... I'm just going to keep doing what God tells me to do. Satan is like a dog on a, on one of those extendable leashes. You, you know you know those extendable leashes where the dog can run for a while and then you can just pop the little thing with your thumb and pull it back. That's kind of like Satan. He has access to heaven. He can go up to God's throne, but we learn from Job that he can only do what God allows him to do. We know how long he's going to have come the end times to to reign and and how long his he's going to be bound and and so Satan is like a dog on a leash. God is allowing him his leash time, but there is an end and there is a conclusion. He has no power. God is in control. God still wins. And he also promises that he'll work all things for good. And I think that's one of the most comforting things we can have in these distressing times is that God works all things for good. Romans eight twenty eight. The worst thing that ever happened to me in my life In hindsight, I can look back and say, wow, the growth that I had from that, what I learned, the type of man I became, it was a game changer for me in the eternal view of my life. I've tested this time and time again. Romans 8.28 is unequivocally true. It always pans out. We can take the promises of God to the bank. 
and he tells us how it's going to go down. And so the first thing I want to encourage is even if I'm right and we only have X number of years, it's nothing to be afraid of. We need to live a certain way now and we need to understand and live with that urgency. You know, every one of the apostles thought that Jesus was coming back during their lifetime and it led to them living with an edge. They had more fruit. I mean, those 12 men changed the world. They lived with an urgency to their life that created greatness. And so there's really not a downside to that. And we've got to understand that on the other end of it is heaven. I mean, we're going to be in heaven. Okay. So there's nothing to be afraid of. We have to trust God. Nothing will come upon you except what is common for man. And he's faithful. He will make a way for you to stand up under it. First Corinthians 10, 13, another great promise. No matter what happens, God will make a way for you to be okay. We can trust him in that. He says we can trust him in that. So how do you live during these times? You know, my last podcast went into that in depth, and I encourage you to listen to it whenever you get a chance, but it's pretty simple. Wake up, be thankful, pray and praise. Starts with the Lord. You got to spend some time with the Lord, even if you don't have time to do much other than lay in your bed and whisper up a a thing of thanks and, and just pray before your feet hit the ground. It's good to do. Pray and praise. Then go into your day in love. So love God, love others. Do the best right where you're at. Stop worrying about trying to hit the next thing and and go after the next thing and just be faithful where you're at for right now and let God open whatever doors have to be open. Let him take you to wherever you have to be because he has a place for you during these times that he wants you in. And maybe you're exactly right there, or maybe he's just waiting for you to be faithful right there before he takes you there. And that's, no one will know but you and God, but we can't change what's coming unless you're a senator or a world leader, and I'm not. We really have no say-so in the events of our time. All you have to do is tend the field that the Lord has given you right where you're at, your territory, be a faithful steward, leave the rest to God. And it is so freeing. All around me are people worn out from news, stressed out over the news. Every day they come and tell me what the news is saying now and this and that. And even people who say, I don't listen to the news anymore, they still can spout out all the news that's happening. They are listening to it, okay? But the beauty of this is if you live this way, you wake up, you spend time with the Lord, then you love, you're loving on God, loving on others. That can't be taken away from you. Like my morning quiet time can't be taken away from me. I can be driving and enjoy the birds singing and the beautiful sunny days. It's a freeing thing to not worry about how it's going to pan out because you have absolute trust that God is going to make it work out okay. It is, in my opinion, the way to live. And although we claim things like with God, all things are possible, we live as if we think nothing's possible. We live trying to control it all and and we have no control over it all so just release that control to the one who is in control i don't know the specifics i don't know who the antichrist is yet what is his day or hour that jesus will come but i do know who is in control and he loves me and he loves you and when suffering happens to me like everyone else listen when bad times come it's going to hit everybody right it's going to hit me just like everybody else i'll learn from it i'll grow i'll become better for it he could be preparing me for what he has for me in heaven because at the end of the day we will have jobs up there too but he will work everything for good. I can wake up each day thankful. This stuff is still years out, really. It's four years away, okay? Today, I have a job to do. The sun is shining. I need to be a faithful steward. I can wake up. I can pray and praise and be thankful and love God and love on others and do my best right where I'm at. And just worry about today. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about what's coming. Be thankful for today. Love and do good today. What I've been teaching here, this was about three months ago when it all came together. Uh, the, The first passage in 09, then the the one in a couple of years ago. And then this year, as I started seeing this war unfold and players starting to line up, I realized, wow, this stuff is starting to happen. And then that was what, three months ago? So I've been trying to live this way since waking up, trying to love on God, love on others, being faithful for the three months. And over the last three months, my joy has become greater. My relationships have become better. My work is getting better. I'm growing. I mean, it's wonderful. There's really no downside to living this way. Whether I'm right or not, and whether this thing is coming sooner rather than later, even if I'm wrong on this timeline, there's no downside to living each day just focused on the day, loving God and loving others, not worrying about the rest. You can do that, and so can I. So let's live how we've been called. Until next time, God bless.